Well, hello, friends. Welcome one and welcome all. I can't offer much in this outdoor hall, but sit here and rest. You must be weary, and I'll share with you Tales of Tyria. <laughs> Welcome one, welcome all. This week on Tales of Tyria, we're talking about a little bit of news about Guild Wars 2's flaws. We're talking about the guilds, everything about guilds, and we have a What You Know segment about the exterior portion of Guild Wars 2 applications on your phone, on your computer, on your desktop. It's going to be great. Stay tuned. Yes, welcome one, welcome all, welcome to another exciting episode of Tales of Tyria. This is episode number eight. We are recording today, 11 27, 2011. Uh, welcome again, the website talesoftyria.com. That's your, that's your Guild Wars 2 podcast site that we've got going on there. We've got an article in there, we've got some more in the works, so if you would uh, like to check it out. Maybe you're only watching the show on YouTube. Maybe you don't even know there is a YouTube channel because you're listening to the audio portion. There is, in fact, a YouTube channel with all the video portions of the show here. So if you want to check that out, uh, feel free. It's at TalesOfTeria.com. Now, we've got a great show for you today. Uh, will you tell a friend about it? We'd like to spread the word, try and make this the pre, the ultimate Guild Wars 2 show that there is. We are almost live from the Rosewind Tavern in the great city of Lion's Arch, and uh, this is going to be a great show. Let me introduce myself. I am Bridger, and uh, joining me, as always, we have the great co-host surrounding me here. Welcome, Mr. Freelancer. How you been doing? How you doing, Bridger? Not bad. What you been up to recently? Uh, I think everybody else can pretty much say Skyrim, right? Yeah. <laughs> I heard you Nothing. finished it. You finished the game? I heard you so. finished it. That's what oh you yeah, said. I finished it, but I mean, I'm still playing another character, so oh, okay. I'll, fin I'll finish it another eight times before I put it up. How about that? All right. Also joining us, we have uh, Vega. Welcome, Vega. How you doing? Good evening. What you been up to recently? Just holiday stuff? Um, yeah, I I took Wednesday off of work. Um, I traveled Tuesday night, so I really haven't been doing much gaming um, this week. But I was playing Skyrim. I haven't beaten it yet. Um, I'm sick of turkey. I've had turkey nearly every day for the past week. Amen. Um, <laughs> that's that's love... different. We had ham one day, which was a good change. I love ham. Ham is the best part of Thanksgiving. People don't know <laughs> it, though. See, we started, uh, we started doing the deep frying um, a couple of years ago, the deep fried turkey. And it's just phenomenal. So I could, I could eat that stuff all day, besides now, because I'm sick of turkey, but... It is delicious. Excellent. Also joining us, who has no idea what Thanksgiving was until we had to let her know all the way from the United <laughs> Kingdom. Kai, welcome. Hello. <laughs> so how have you been enjoying your not holidays? Oh, I wish I had turkey. I miss it and I have to wait till Christmas. <laughs> yeah, we had to have it twice here. Twice. I know. It sucks. So I've just played SWOTOR instead and not Skyrim. <laughs> oh, no fair. Actually, I don't care. I don't really have anything invested in that. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, let's move right into it here. Uh, we have uh, not really a whole lot of news. We're in the doldrums before the closed beta comes out here. But we do have um, an interesting article on the Team Quitter website that went up you know, right after our last uh, show that sort of had a similar theme to it and I think touched on a few items that we didn't touch on in our how Guild, why Guild Wars 2 would fail, you know, criticisms of the flaws of the game and things like that. So I want to uh, just, you know, go over the, the article and see what our thoughts are on that right now. So let us see. We're going to the website. Here we go. This is the article you can see here on uh, Guild Wars, uh, sorry, on Team Quitter. Now, if you are following along in the chat room here. I'll post the link for you. There we go. And uh, you'll also see the show notes linked on the main site there if you are uh, not following along live, if you're listening to this later. 
So go to talesofteria.com for those, and you can find a link to the same article we're talking about here. So they are talking about the first number 10 here, profession overlap. This is kind of their discussion about the Holy Trinity won't actually be gone. There will be some other form of tr Trinity and, um, you know, professions overlap in a lot of ways, and the ones that are the best, the ones that are going to get used, and other ones aren't going to get used. Um, I, I, I guess... To me, that doesn't seem like too big of an issue only because to some extent um, there's going to be so much patching going on that the game can't really get stale. If, if one class gets used to the exclusive of others, or if one class is underused, it's just going to get buffed, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know. I, I got to be honest with you, Bridger. Uh, when, when I was reading this article, I saw a lot of the fact that you have a community that is based around Guild Wars 1, a very respectable community, don't get me wrong. Um, but you have a single person who wrote a in-depth look in his own opinion um, mm -hmm. on why it's not like uh, Guild Wars 1, why this aspect or this aspect's going to fail. What I do see a lot in that article is opinionated, you know, I don't want to give this a try type. And that is my own opinion. Um, but... I think there's a lot of complaining just because he didn't actually really take a look at a lot of it. And uh, I'm assuming you're going to hit all the points, but I'll, I'll jump in on a few of the, the big ones I had a big disagreement about. So, Okay. Uh, let's go into uh, another one here, why don't we, and take a look. The next one, it's not Guild Wars. That's something kind of that I think we covered last week is, yeah, it's, it's not Guild Wars, So it's it, and that actually is a PR problem, which is, is definitely a real problem, is a lot of people see the the game as being let's zoom in here so easier for the people on there we go on view on, on reading there we go um people who th see guild wars 2 and go well i didn't like the first guild wars so i'm not going to try it and those people get just ignore it completely because they think it's just like the original guild wars or has the same focus and then other people who maybe have played guild wars 1 and like that style and won't like the style of guild wars 2 will also be miscommunicated but i think they're doing a fantastic job marketing the game so far people out there know what it's about or am i wrong i think there's still a lot of people who aren't going to play it because they hated guild wars 1 so much and i think they are so different and if people aren't watching videos and aren't getting involved, just like you know, we ourselves are and the community are, I think it's hard to persuade them that it's not going to be like Guild Wars One. I think. Yeah. Go ahead. I think that they they haven't done too much marketing for it. You know, I mean, they've they've been at the shows and stuff, but you know, to in order to really find out about what they're doing, you really have to dig into it. So if you didn't like Guild Wars One, and you don't you know, if you don't run, if you don't dig in and find out what they're changing and all the stuff they're improving, then you kind of miss out on why it isn't like Guild Wars One. So as long as you're just not ignorant and you, you know, do a little bit of reading, you could see what they've changed and how it's going to be better. And I think with regards to the PR thing, it only requires a certain critical mass of people to where if two of your friends are talking about the game, you might go check it out even if you, you know passionately hated Guild Wars 1 or something like that, you might still, you know, jump into that conversation and say, no, Guild Wars 2 is going to suck because Guild Wars 1 sucked. And then they can turn to you and say, it's nothing like Guild Wars 1 and here's why. And that's what gets the conversation going. So you just need a critical mass of people who actually do know what's going on. And there's clearly a massive fan base. I mean, when you go to Guild Wars Guru and GuildWars2Guru.com and there's 400 people browsing the general discussion every second of nearly every day, that's, that's a huge community for a game that's not even out yet. That's very impressive. Yeah. All right. Let's jump on to their, uh, their next point here. Elites are obtrusive. And they basically try to point out that elites are basically just extra damage for all intents and purposes, and, and battles are going to boil down to if my opponent activates their elite, I run away, use my own elite, or die. If I activate my elite, my opponent runs away, activates the elite, or die. It sort of waters down the intricate combat of trying to time your interesting abilities by just having one giant massive ability that's clearly better than all the others, and it's on a cooldown, yeah, and it's a long cooldown, but what that means is you're going to use it every three minutes is pretty much as soon as it's available in the condition where it would be useful. Um, I don't know, have you guys looked at the descriptions of the, uh, of the, the elites and trying to find out uh, at all what they do 
Yeah, I, I mean, we've all all of us and in, in our guild have looked looked over a lot of the elites, and I still I still joke with a lot of my buddies now about the fact that I think that the tornado is a little OP, and mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, just the the fact you could press one button and immediately toss entire groups of people around is is quite comical, but also seems a little uh, over the edge. I, I don't know. I mean, let's look at other games that have had a, elite or finishing skills, right? Um, how did they fare? I mean, when uh, Super Smash Brothers brought in um, uh, Smash Ball and, and Brawl, yeah, when they brought the Smash Ball into play, what immediately happened to the Smash Ball? It was immediately banned from tournaments. It was, you know, it, it was the first thing to go. Um, the, the a lot of tournaments now have kind of adapted to it, but uh, it's still one of those things that if you get killed by a, you know somebody that uses their Smash Attack and Smash Brothers, it's kind of one of those gimmicky things where the guy's like, oh, well, you use the smash attack, so it doesn't count, you know. And I kind of feel like that's gonna have to be uh, structured in a way in Guild Wars 2 where it's not so overpowered, where one attack or one skill can basically push the entire tide of the game. Maybe that's a good thing. But if you look at all the big competitive games out there, uh, StarCraft 2, Quake, um, any huge competitive game, Counter Strike. There's no single skill or single weapon that uh, if somebody gets it or somebody uses it, it completely turns the tide of the game because then it's not as exciting because everybody's waiting for that big big ultimate skill and nobody's really waiting for the actual skill of the player with all the other things they could do. So um, I don't know. We'll see. It's just like Philectic mentioned in chat, League of Legends. If you play it, you know, everyone has got that kind of elite ultimate mm -hmm. skill and you know that every character, hero, whatever you want to call it, has got that skill and you've got to time it perfectly. If you use that skill at the beginning of a one-on-one -on -one fight with someone, it's wasted and it's not going to kill them. You need to kind of get them down to low health and then use it. So I still think even though the skills might be overpowered before release, you still have to know how to use them, have to time it right and you know use it on the right classes, professions. So I don't think you could just kill an entire bunch of people with one elite skill, I think you do still know how to use it and when to use it. I think that's important. That's definitely the hope. I mean, the hope is that the skills, the, the elite skills are not just damage spike, you know, super pyroblast kind of a thing. It's more like yeah. it, like the Lich form is sort of a good example of a very interesting elite skill. It, it, it doubles your health and then gives you new you know, options in combat, whereas, you know, something like the tornado is just, you know, damage spike. But again, damage spike has its has its use like you're talking about when somebody is kind of low on health, but they think they're still okay. They don't have to leave combat yet. They might still have this and then bam, out of nowhere comes this damage spike uh, that, that really hurt, puts them in pain. You have to really then every moment of combat is really interesting and not just the last moment of combat. So, yeah. you know, elites, it's really going to depend on are they interesting or not i don't know jay jay any final thoughts on that i think it'll also come down to once people once the game is actually being played by more people you know there's always going to be someone that finds a way to break something and yeah. when someone finds that flaw or that exploit you know they'll patch it if the tornado is too strong it's easy enough for them just to you know patch the damage so you know for them for the for you know to say to make a very general statement that elites are going to completely ruin battle um, I don't think I don't think it's justified because there's plenty of ways to, you know, patch things, improve things. But I like the concept of having the elite skill because, as Caillou was saying in, in League of Legends, you know, it gives you something you need to worry about and something you need to plan for to counter. Yep. Yep. All right, so I think we, uh, we, we discussed that pretty well. Choices are problems. Now, here he actually brings up a quote-unquote flaw that is pretty much in, ingrained in every MMO ever, is that there is an optimal set of moves that will do the most DPS, period. If you have this set of gear to choose from, and you have this set of abilities, if you activate them in this order over and over again, that will give you the most DPS. It's a math problem, is basically what he's pointing out, and that's not an interesting choice. Whereas in an FPS game, timing and when you go from one place to another really affects it. He says everything's going to boil down to this math problem, but that's sort of inherent in all MMOs. Am I wrong? I yeah, think I you... Mean... 
Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, you always have the people that strive to be better, like better than everyone else. And you'll always have the people that spend hours and hours of every single day trying to find the moves that do add together to be the best. And unfortunately, those posts will get put on the internet and other people will start using them. But as Vega said earlier, like if it's noticed that they are too overpowered, it will get fixed. And I think it's something that you just got to balance out and, you know, just go on your own initiative and play how you want to play. And I think Guild Wars 2 is definitely making that a big thing, is that play it because it has fun, not because it does tons of damage. Freelancer? Uh, every game's going to... Whether a game is, is meant to be a number-crunching game or whether it's... Uh, you know, whether they actually throw the numbers out there, like the formulas for a while, for example, um, to develop your crit rating, you know, using an X amount of agility versus whatever other stats. Uh, whether those numbers are out there or not, there's always going to be a group of people that will extract those numbers through testing or otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, Guild Wars 2 is not going to be any different. Um, even if it is mentioned among others that, oh, uh, this is going to be a kitty game because they don't clearly define the stats. Uh, you give it a month's time, everything's going to oh, be yeah. defined. You know, everything is a number game, um, and nothing will change in Guild Wars Two. I think the only thing that may change is timing and and the dodging aspect of it, and the timed blocks and things like that with the shields. Those are going to add non mathematical elements to the game that I think will certainly make it a little bit more interesting from a you know sort of Twitch perspective. It feels like to me that the game is going to have more Twitch elements, more like a first-person shooter. Obviously, it's not going to be as Twitch as like a Quake 4-style game, but it's going to be more than World of Warcraft or, or any others. I don't know. Do you disagree, Vega? No, I was, that's actually what I was going to say, is that the fact, you know, when you, when you look at World of Warcraft or other MMOs, there's no positional advantages in the game. It's All they just... have to do is be in front of you. Yeah, you pick the target, and you know, then you have your your skill rotation. I feel like obviously there's going to be better skills and things people are going to use more often. But the fact that you know field position and using skills in conjunction with other players adds damage or adds effects, it kind of decreases that likelihood that there's just going to be one skill rotation that all rangers are going to use. And you know, when you look at a game like also StarCraft Two, when when that first came out, everyone was saying, you know, here are the builds that are doing great. But every tournament, there's always someone that's, you know, changing changing a build order or trying a new strategy and just messing with things. And, you know, obviously StarCraft II is kind of hard to compare just to a game, to an MMO. But it's just the fact that you give people time and they'll find ways to come up with better strategies. Yep. And uh, I think the the final point that probably needs to be Actually, I forgot what I was going to say. All right, moving on. <laughs> I had something else, and then I was working on something. Okay, so he, he then goes to talk about how you know weapons aren't really a choice because they're all the same. I didn't notice that as being a real problem. The weapons definitely felt like they had different uses and different roles. And I think he, he points to specifically the axes and talks about how the axes are all the same kind of a thing. And I think that might be true for a few of the weapons. Might not be... Uh, as well made designed as some of the other weapons to really give you some interesting things like if a weapon is simply does range damage and then does range damage in AoE and then the next skill is does range damage with bleed effect like those aren't nearly as interesting as if one of them does knockdown but does less damage and another one does damage over time but less upfront damage and another one does like if they're usable in different ways I think that's the key to making a really well-designed weapon because it's, a weapon is basically a set of skills. And you want that set of skills to be really interesting and not just the same thing over and over again with slightly different differences. I think having looked at the ones that I have looked at, they all do seem like that. I don't know. Kai, have you looked at any of them? Yeah, I mean, I focused mainly on looking at Guardian and Elementalist weapons. But I think... If you're really interested in a game, generically people do look at what weapons they're going to use, especially the amount of resources that we already have on Guild Wars 2 and the amount of videos that are on YouTube. I have looked at various weapons that I could use and the Elementalists and the Guardian seem really different. I mean, the Warrior, there are a few that are quite similar, 
But I think if you don't want to play a class where all the weapons are similar, don't pick a warrior. I think people should just look into it. And as they all do have different uses, but I think, as you said, some are kind of linear and have very little differences. But I think pick a different class, play something that if you want big differences, like the elementalist, where you have stuns, AOE, single target, or ones that have healing, then I think that's something more for you if, you know, that's a problem. All right. Uh, Freelancer, what do you think about his sixth point here where his, his problem is that Conquest is the only PvP mode? He seems to be a fan of, like, Capture the Flag, and that's really – it really is – I like Capture the Flag better than Conquest. Uh, what do you think from a gameplay perspective for these kinds of games? What's your favorite game mode? I think uh, that statement is, is very much unfounded. I don't agree with it. I think uh, it was something thrown together really quick. Conquest being an only PvP mode, let me clarify this for all of our viewers, that is only in the beginning. Nothing has been officially stated that down the road they won't be adding anything. That's yes, true. I did look That's over true. the threads. Yes, I did look at all the videos, so please don't link any. I've done my research, and he should have done his. Um, so that particular point uh, i don't think it belonged in there um he's mentioning that that's the only thing you'll be able to do in pvp he never mentioned once about world versus world mm -hmm. um he never mentioned the fact that there'll be modes added later uh, and he never mentioned how dynamic conquest is just in itself um that particular uh two three paragraphs he typed out there i felt were very opinionated um, to say that Conquest is the only PvP mode, like that's a bad thing, is the same as saying that, uh, heck, in uh, StarCraft II, the only thing you could do is destroy your enemy's base. Does that make StarCraft II a bad competitive game? Um, I just think it's such a, you know, he, he didn't really break out into the depth of that. He should have... Um, when I read over that, I got a little ticked off, if you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, so. he could have a point. If, if in, in the end, if Conquest does not promote interesting, you know, from, from I mean, if we're talking about this from an esports point of view, which you usually do, if Conquest is not as interesting to watch, if the, if the actual battle is very static and not super interesting compared to some other modes, that could definitely be a problem. What's your thought on Conquest versus, you know, any of the other type of game modes that are in there for an FPS, RTS, I mean, not FP, RTS, but for, for these kind of games, FPS or third-person MMO? Well, take a look at other games. I mean, you look at anything from Team Fortress to, uh, well, even StarCraft. I mean, they're all Conquest-related um uh, I should have put this metaphorically, they're all the same. The most popular game modes proven through time, which is why ArenaNet started with Conquest, was the idea of capturing different points strategically to win a game. Instead of having just a straight out deathmatch, which they could have done, they could have thrown in an arena type game, and I'm sure they still will, where you just, in a little small, you know, everybody's played WoW, and if you haven't, you're missing out, uh, where you have a little small arena where you just go at it, and there may be. A few obstacles here and there, but it's that's the general idea of the game. But they took the most popular concept for good reason, and they're expanding upon that first, first being keyword. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that was a bad idea. I have to tell you, what I am hoping for, and what the mode that I have thought was always the best from a casting point of view, from a playing point of view, for many different reasons, is the stopwatch attack defense mode. And this, you know, the first time that I was exposed to this is sort of the Return to Castle Wolfenstein style, um, where one team has a certain set of objectives they need to uh, do, which is like they have to attack, and first they have to breach this, and they have to do that, then they have to do this. That may not necessarily be what needs to happen, but maybe just the attackers just have to get to point X, let's say, within a Guild Wars 2 conquest. They have to force their way in to get to point X. And... Uh, the defenders have a disadvantage of some kind. Maybe their spawn takes a lot longer. It, it just built in such a way that the attackers are almost guaranteed to win given enough time. And then the goal is for the attackers to do as fast as possible, and then the sides switch, and then the defenders have to beat the time that the, the, the former defenders now have to beat the time that the attackers set. And I found that always really interesting and very exciting because the game is ends exactly at the time when the other team can't possibly win. It ends no sooner and no later, right? So let's say the goal is for the defending team to capture, uh, sorry, the attacking team to capture a flag and bring it back to their side of the map, right? 
and the attacking team then, they push forward, they push forward, they push forward, they take it and they bring it back in, let's say, 10 minutes and 30 seconds. The defending team now has 10 minutes and 30 seconds to get a hold of that flag and bring it all the way back. Let's say at the 10 minute mark, they have 30 seconds left. They still have, if they make this push really smart and really fast and they get to the flag and they hold on to the flag, it'll go into overtime and just long enough for them to try to get it back. That is exciting right down to the wire, right? Right down to the wire. Nobody knows who's going to win. Either team still could win. Whereas in a conquest mode like we have now, it can be close, but it doesn't always wind up that way. And it's in, in, you know, if one team has two points and they're at 450 points and the other team has one point and they're at 100 points, there's almost a, you know, no chance that they make a comeback at that point. I don't know. Freelancer, you're the, you're the main PvP guy. What do you think about that? It just gets back to the same stuff. I mean, if to say that, uh, quote unquote, conquest is one dimensional, I just looked at it again, um, is to say that uh, American football is one dimensional. It's to say that basketball is one dimensional. I just think it's so narrow. Um, but I wanted to hit on that thing we just spoke of about um, weapon layouts and the skills associated with them. Mm -hmm. One thing I think is kind of counterproductive uh, in arena net sense is the fact that they're requiring certain weapon sets and, and i'm sure you know this will be worked out later but one thing i can't help but think now as i'm explaining this game to my friends is the fact that what if i want to roll a thief and i want to be that sneaky assassin type character but all of the best skills will say the damage dealing skills or the stunning skills or whatever it might be are um all the better ones are on guns what if i don't ever want to use guns so for uh, ArenaNet to really promote the fact that you can go into this in-depth character customization, uh, you can go into this big backstory thing, you can really get into your character, right? Um, and then force you to use particular skills in pati uh, particular situations. Um, I don't know. I I'm going to have to see that in action. I'm not one of the guys that laid my hands on it, but I've talked to people who have, and they felt similar, where in order to get something done, you had to very specifically, let's say, choose a sword or, or daggers uh, or choose guns, and they didn't particularly like that. They don't like being forced to use different weapon sets. Some people just want to go smash things with a great hammer, a uh, great war hammer, or, and some, th some people just want to use a bow. They want to be a ranger. Um, and I think that ArenaNet is saying, no, in order to kill that mob that has a magical shield, you must use this skill or this skill. So uh, I'm hoping that um, they in the direction they're taking it, which it looks good so far, that they kind of expand upon those abilities. Because so far, the people I've talked to uh, have not had that experience. Excellent. Okay. Well, that's good to hear. Uh, there's a few more things in here, nothing that I really wanted to look into uh, personally, but uh, if you guys want to check it out, there's a link in the show notes, talesofteria.com, and uh, that'll, that'll be up. That'll also, if you're watching this on YouTube, the show notes should be in the description here for you. And uh, so let's move right along then. Uh, let's talk about guilds. And I don't know how much time we're going to have, but let's use as much as we can. Uh, guilds are a very intricate part of MMOs. I mean, they, they, they are all tied into MMOs at this point. People like to have an official group with their friends. They don't like to just say, yeah, we're the traveling adventurers. They like to say, we are, you know, Acquisition Incorporated, and check it out, we've got a cape right here that has our symbol on it. They like the recognition. People like to belong to things. I mean, that's why they join mercenary groups in the real life and all kinds of crazy things in the Middle Ages. You had all kinds of groups that like to be together. Cause So, I don't know where I'm going with this. Let's move back into the <laughs> questions here. All right, Vega, what makes a guild successful? Go. Ooh, that's a that's like a that's a hard one. <laughs> Give him uh -huh. the hard hard one there. <laughs> it all what makes a guild successful is if it's fun for you. So in in saying that, I mean that there's people that want a hardcore raiding guild or a hardcore PvP guild, and there's some people that want something that's not so hardcore. So you know, it's all about finding that group. Well, figure out what figuring out first what you want to do. And then trying to find a group that does that. And as long as, you know, I feel that's what makes a good guild is something that's in line with what you want to do in the game. All right. Uh, yeah. Kai, you're, you're, you're in a guild right now. What, what, what would you say, you know, let's say, you know, three months after the game's out, what, mm -hmm. what would you consider to, to say, okay, my guild is successful. We're doing really well right now. 
Um, I would say that it's got a good, healthy community where people are happy and they want to log on and generally do things together. I think if there's just a guild where no one talks to each other and it's all individual players just kind of under one name, to me that's not like a successful, happy community. But again, as Vegas said, different guilds are completely different. Hardcore guilds barely talk to each other outside of raids and endgame PvP, whereas you have casual guilds who purely just kind of chat and socialize. So it, I think it is 100% down to the members of the guild, what the guild leaders want, and yeah, what you class your guild as. All right, so, so kind of what I'm hearing is guilds have a mission statement. Either this is a hardcore raiding guild or we're just here to have fun with some PvP on the side or we just want somebody to level with. And as long as a guild is meeting that goal and everybody in the guild, uh, you know, agrees with that goal, then mm -hmm. it sounds like that's a successful guild. What do you think, Freelancer? I think successful guilds have wenches, beer, and gold <laughs> churches. <laughs> You have to have three things to be successful. Otherwise, I don't want to talk to you. You must have a successful. <laughs> no, I'm not going to go there. Um, it's it's it, right there. You got to have laugh. I mean, we're talking about the uh, statistical parts of successful guilds, but what keeps a guild together is is, is good laughs, communication, uh, just people getting along. I mean, whether you are hardcore, whether you are casual, and to all, everybody that's looking to start their own guild, it's, it's, it's all about the final point, which is relationships. Um, not going to go too much in depth on that, but you got to have good relationships. You got to get along with your, uh, with your guildmates. And at the end of the day, whether you are number one, whether you're number 23, if your guild is, is happy, they're sharing moments, they're, they know each other by name, they can recall memories, I think that is a successful guild. Okay. I completely agree, yeah. So let's talk about one of the more controversial aspects of guilds within Guild Wars 2, and that's the fact that when you join a guild, it's bound to your account, meaning that you can you know, have all of your alts on that, on that same account, all of your alternate characters are actually part of that guild as well. You can then also be part of more than one guild. Each account can be part of many guilds. I don't know. There's probably a limit somewhere. I don't know, upward of 10 or something. But uh, the controversy is if people can be part of more than one guild, and what makes a guild really great a lot of the times, I think, is, in, in, is people investing in the guild. If people, uh, you know, log on to the forums and talk and make suggestions and they show up for, you know, the organized events and they help to organize things and they promote stuff. You know, there's a lot of jobs, quote unquote, to be done within a guild to make it really successful. I mean, the, the kinds of things that happen in a guild don't just happen. Somebody has to organize it. So that organization is usually comes from somebody being invested in the guild or multiple people. Do you guys think, let's start with, uh, with you, Freelancer, because you kind of started a major guild. Do you think if people are in multiple guilds that that is going to have a problem because they're going to be spreading their investment across multiple guilds? I'll tell you, Bridget, you're going to cast me as the evil one right away, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, it depends. Okay. Let's do a reality check. Is your guild a PvP guild or is it a PvE guild? Uh, if it is a PvP guild, you have no business being part of one more than one guild. I'm just going to go out there and say it. Um, the idea is cool that if you're casual, you just want to have friends, you want to play the game like 95% of the other players do, um, joining more than one guild is fine. Um, it's, it's, it's promoted. I mean, you can meet more people and you can get along and do fun things and raids and stuff. That's dandy. Okay. Uh, PvP, no. Um, especially anybody that takes it seriously. You cannot, on a serious level, play and practice and develop strategies with one group of people and then flip over to another group of people. And we're not even going to go into security reasons, but you, you just can't do that. you got to be steady, steady, practice, practice, practice. What makes the top SC2 players in the world? What do they do? Anybody here in chat, anybody listening to this podcast can tell you it's practice, practice, repetition, repetition. And that's a, that is not repetition with, uh, you know, with other teams and other players. Yes, they, they scrimmage against them, they play against them, but they're still part of one team in, in one, I don't know, it's hard to explain, but you see what I'm getting at. Yeah, um, yeah I'll end there. <laughs> no, it's PvP teams, like, yeah. go ahead, yeah. 
it, it's like being a traitor. If you're in a PvP guild and you play together, you train together, and you want to be that top guild on your server for PvP, or even not the top, but a guild that people know and fear in Battlegrounds, you can't then go join another PvP guild that are essentially kind of enemies or competing. I think that's just wrong, but I completely agree. With PvE, it's not really that competitive. I mean, you couldn't really raid in two guilds because you wouldn't have the time, but if they're both kind of casual, then that's fine. But yeah, I agree. You couldn't be in two PvP guilds. Yeah, that, that kind of echoes the sort of FPS clan mentality where, you know, people have ringers or something from another clan and that's always frowned upon and when when that's discovered it's like ooh it's, it's bad news so um so it it's it certainly i i can see a huge advantage of this though and that is basically i could be in like let's say a hardcore pvp guild like i'm in team legacy that's going to be the pvp guild that i'm in but i'm also going to have a circle of friends that i like to play with that maybe we'll have our own little five person guild so that when we're leveling together we can put on our little you know Team South Windsor or something, Connecticut, yeah, you know, you know, little thing. Yeah, we're representing our own little group of awesome people. And and that is going to be great. Or maybe maybe when I'm just, you know, we feel like playing some PvP together, me and my wife and my friend and his wife and maybe another friend that when you're by or maybe somebody else from Team Legacy uh, that we play with on a regular basis, we can have our own little thing that we just do for fun. It's not something you treat serious but i agree with you completely you're not going to have two serious guilds that you're that pvp guilds that is frowned upon in every game that i've ever seen i mean you're not going to see michael jordan playing for the bulls and then going over to the lakers to play the next game that just doesn't happen so, so it, it sounds like because I, I see what they're i can understand what they're doing and that they want people to be able to play with their friends if their friends are in different guilds and so on and so forth but i mean realistically you know, I agree with what what uh, freelancer was saying is that in PvP, you know, that's just not going to work if you're trying to do real serious PvP. What if they just gave people the option to make capes, personalized capes that you can give to your friends and run around with your own symbols and stuff on no, capes? No, no, because that because you still like level up these guilds and there's still an achievement kind of thing. I don't know. I I I kind of like the hat. I mean, I like the way that it is. In fact, you can you can change who you're representing at any given moment. There still probably will be problems with ringers. Like, oh man, we can't get somebody, but our buddy in this other guild, you know, he's offered to come and help us out. But, you know, there's going to be gray areas. But I think, yeah. I think it's still a positive step. I think one thing we're not hitting on, and I could just see the email coming in, is uh, in regards to competitive PvP, um, guilds, guilds are guilds. They have nothing to do with it. Um, that's you can true. actually form your own teams, you know, it can consist of members of multiple guilds. So, for example, you know, our guild may have, uh, let's say, five theoretical members, or uh, is it five or six for competitive It's, it's five for competitive PvP. Okay, five. Um, so let's assume we have five members and one of them drops out. You know, the option is always there for a top-level guild to reach out and say, we're looking for somebody that can play on a professional level with us, and they can pull in another person from an entirely different guild. That team is still intact. And I think that's important to note that, first off, it's unheard of in, in MMOs um, up until now. And secondly, it, it gives you a lot more options as far as from a business perspective if you are one of those guilds. Um, like ours is where that you, you, you're actually going to be going to events. You're actually going to be funding these players. And we're getting way out into the professional side of things. But if I need to replace a member, um, I don't have to look within just my own guild. I can form a, a team of elite members from multiple guilds. And they can go out and be famous and go out and win prize money. And I think that's very cool. So that's, that's something I was never quite sure. So you're saying when you sign up for uh, an official tournament, let's say, you know, either a pickup tournament or a monthly tournament or something like that, you form a team, and a team is a completely separate entity from a guild. It could be composed of all guild members, and you could call it, for example, Team Legacy, or, uh, team legacy you know, um, Squad A. And then Team Legacy Squad B could be another set of five players from Team Legacy, for example. But those teams, those separate teams of five people, are not restricted to only being in Team Legacy. Right. I mean, I could have a team of, of myself, another guild. Kaylee could be on it. Jay could be on it. And we could have our own dream team and and go out, have fun. And, and who knows? Maybe, you know, we make the monthly and... Uh, 
and go from there. You just never know, and, and I think the chemistry is what's important. You may find that within your own guild, as far as the serious, you know, hardcore players that are doing only arena type games, that reaching out might be just your best thing to do. Um, and they give you that option in Guild Wars 2, and I like that. I agree. I, There's like a lot of my friends who, for example, live in America or other people I've met who do YouTube videos, they all have their own guilds, but I know for a fact that I want to play with them. So we might make have our own little like YouTube or like if we all had like a little podcast team, like I would love that, but we may all be in different guilds. So I don't think we should you're totally limited. make us a guild just for podcasters. Make it like yeah. an elite, we talk on the internet <laughs> guild. If you have a YouTube channel with over a thousand people subscribed, or you have a podcast, if you can come in, come join us. We're awesome. <laughs> oh, that's an awesome idea. All right, so let's talk about, because I, I wanted to get to this. This is an interesting, what is your greatest guild or, or let's also open it up to clan experience, because I, I haven't really been in too many guilds, uh, per se, but I have been in quite a few clans and FPS games. So, Jay, do you have any moments that come to mind? Um, well, one of, my, one of my greatest, it wasn't with, um, I guess it was more of a clan, but it was, you know, it was a bunch of my buddies, and this was back in Diablo 2, so it wasn't really, you know, like clans or guilds or anything, but it was just a group of guys that I played with all the time. Mm -hmm. I remember one time we were playing, and uh, this was around. I don't know if anyone remembers like the Shadow Diablo when he started like coming around. But you you'd enter a game and it, you get a little message that says like Diablo walks the earth, and mm -hmm. somewhere in Act One was Diablo just walking around a field, and so there's maybe three or four of us, and we found him, and he was he was really hard to find, but you know we spent like an hour or two just trying to kill him, like just. We had, like, high-level characters just going at them, but they made them a lot stronger and all this other crap. But it was just so much fun having those four guys working together for, like, this hour or two period just trying to take down Diablo. And that's just something that I always remember. Um, in terms of guilds, you know, I was in a, I was in a guild in World of Warcraft, um, and... You know, I had some fun, like, raiding with them and stuff, but it was, it was hard keeping up because they were pretty hardcore. And so, you know, they'd pull ahead, and if I didn't play every single day trying to get better gear and stuff, I'd fall behind and wouldn't be able to sort of participate with them. So sort of a good experience and a bad experience um, with guilds. All right. Uh, Kai, what's your best and or worst experience? Um, the best experience was when I first hit, like, level 80 in World of Warcraft because I was a little raff baby, and it was my first guild that I ever joined, and it was, like... 15 to 20 ish people in there but they were all so close and they all met up and had like LAN parties together even though they were all across Europe and everyone became so close and I still speak to some of them now and I think the community just made it good even though we did a PvP or PvE end game and I think we tried Ice Crown Citadel and like failed at the trash but we had so much fun doing it that it didn't even matter and then my worst guild was when I probably hardcore raided in WoW and it was abusive. <laughs> Everyone hated each other, people left the guild every day and came back and it was just a horrible community and I hated that and vowed never ever to be in a guild like that ever again. Alright, Freelancer, I know you got some stories. Yeah, sadly what Kaylee said is pretty uh, truthful for most WoW guilds nowadays. Uh, I think that's probably one of the biggest downsides of WoW, to be honest. Uh, everybody's gotten so serious about the number crunching stuff. But um, my, uh, oh heck, my guild experience, let me think back here a second. Um, probably my favorite times, my most notable times was... Uh, when I was playing Warhammer online, um, I know I bring that up a lot on this podcast, but it, it had such a raiding uh, family environment. Um, we didn't have that that Hitler esque uh, <laughs> raiding environment. We we actually we were the number one, uh, quite literally the number one guild on um, on the order side. It was order versus destruction in that game. And uh, everywhere we went, we, you know, everybody knew our name, and it, it just felt nice, you know, when when you go places and people ask your guild for help, and and they really look up to you to show them how to do things. Um, but the best parts about it is I shared some of my best experiences with that guild. Um, a lot of my friends uh, from that guild, even now, uh, join with me with uh, Team Legacy. Uh, I I got married uh, while I was in that guild. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, I met, met, the, met the girl of my dreams uh, through that guild, through Context. Uh, I mean, it's when you get to that kind of level, that 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 more personal level, you, it, it doesn't leave you. You know, those people will always be with you to this day. Now, the worst guilds I've been in, um, uh, I, I don't know. I don't have the patience to stay with a, guild, a bad <laughs> guild for more than a day, so I don't really have many worst guilds. Worst guilds nowadays are pretty much defined by those who... Uh, are run by 16 year olds who think they're the best and that's a dkb minus <laughs> <laughs> great video by the way um, that is fantastic we'll have to put a link in the show notes yeah it, it's <laughs> you have so many guilds even starting up now that i think are to be defined as worse guilds just because there's all that hype to be number one but nobody can really put forth the effort to do it they just expect it to happen and those are the worst guilds out there absolutely so i've actually got two from my clan days and sort of one that counts as maybe best and worst. Uh, so back from the best experience was actually sort of a schadenfreude, but uh, back when I was doing playing TFC, Team Fortress Classic, um, there was another, another clan, and I can still remember the name, Lust for Armageddon, LFA. And this is sort of, you know, our, our arch enemy, for all intents and purposes, we were always fighting them for the top spot on the OGL ladder, and we were always fighting them in a bunch of other things, and um, we sat at sort of an allied clan that we would scrimmage with a lot, because they were a bunch of cool guys, and we were a bunch of cool guys, and we got along really well, and they didn't like our arch nemesis, the LFA clan, either. Now, uh, they, because basically these guys were jerks. They'd come in, they'd trash talk, they'd make fun of you for everything. It was just, it was, they were real jerks. So, one time... On the OGL ladder, our allies were actually in the number one spot. I think we were in the number three spot or so. And LFA was challenging them for the number one spot. They wound up winning that game. They posted the screenshot of their you know, victory to their website. One of our members happened to look at it and go, Huh, how come those models look so odd in the background? And managed to point it out to the OGL admins who looked in the background of the screenshot on the LFA site. They were bragging, you know, look how awesome we are. And in the background, you can see that they are cheating with special models that make players, you know, stick out around corners and things like that. So you know that they're coming and stick through walls so you know where they are. And they got kicked out of the league. And it was one of the best experiences that we ever had was just this awesome feeling of justice that these assholes had finally got what was coming to them. And they were clearly cheaters as well. And they sunk their own ship by posting... A, a, an image of their own cheating on their own website. So that was one of sort of the schadenfreude best moments that we ever had. One of the worst moments, I have to say, this goes way back to the original Team Fortress for Quake, back when people didn't have, or, or very few people, had cable connections or DSL connections. We were all on, you know, 56K dial-up. We were playing in a tournament called the Swamp Thing Tournament, and... This was on this particular series of maps called the Swamp Tournament. Swamp 1, Swamp 2, Swamp 3, etc. And we were really good at this. That was our clan's favorite map. We practiced on it all the time. We got all the way to the semifinals. And the other team that we had to face was a team of entirely composed of people with pings of 50 or less. And I probably still have the screenshot somewhere on my computer. Of the score is 14 to 0. And every single one of their players has a ping of less than 50. And I think there's not maybe two on our team have a ping of less than 300 <laughs> because of the crappy server they picked. And that was such a demoralizing moment. It's just like we had no chance and there was nothing we could do and we had come so far in that tournament because we were not very good. And the fact that we got to semifinals we thought was really amazing and then to get crushed 14-0 to felt terrible. <laughs> oh, that was bad. You know what's depressing is we're talking about guilds. you got so many people forming guilds right now. I mean, and... We really know nothing from ArenaNet about guilds. It's, no. it's, yeah. <laughs> it's depressing. It really is. I mean, here we are, it, people in the chat, people listening to this down the road. All of us have these high hopes for these great guilds. You know, we start trying to set good examples, and we have no idea, you know, exactly how they're going to work. Uh, they, the, they've the, mentioned like guild wars. They'd have a little more information. <laughs> Yeah, they've mentioned, you know, they're they're trying to push the community so much, but they've, you know, I don't know. We'll see. I, I'm hoping that within the next month we hear, number one, the eighth class, uh, <laughs> Mesmer, and, uh, <laughs> and um, 
more about guilds. I, I just want to hear about the structure, the features. I mean, I know we're not going to have a guild hall. Uh, that was depressing to hear, but uh, not a not a right away anyway. Yeah. Um, but what what will we be able to do as a guild? Will we have achievements? Will we be able to take guild keeps? Will we be able to uh, claim statues for ourselves? You know, I want to hear those things. Yeah, it'll. It, I mean, they've they've sort of vaguely mentioned the fact that guilds will be able to capture castles in world PvP, which sounds pretty awesome. And you know, they'll be able to purchase upgrades for those castles to try and make them more defensible or something. And so clearly, there's going to be sort of a guild currency. I think they kind of mentioned that you'll mm -hmm. earn is it influence? I believe when you do things, you know, basically in sort of the same kind of system that where if you're if you're a guild in wow when you earn experience as a player you also earn guild experience for all intents and purposes i think that's sort of the same thing when you participate in guild style events uh with you know either questing with a guild mate or playing wow world versus world with with your guild that you will earn influence points and those points will be added to your guild so that it levels up and or you could spend something but we really don't know much about it it's just sort of the general structure and not even much of that. Like, we're still unsure about that. I, 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 there may be something slightly more in-depth, but I don't think there's much. Um, so, let's see. Anything else that we want to talk about? Uh, so, you mentioned guild halls. Um, Vega, is there any other structures, mechanically, built into the game that you would like to see there to support guilds? Um, I really liked what, um, what World of Warcraft did with Cataclysm or I guess maybe it was before Cataclysm, but when they started having, um, you know, like the, the guild sort of experience and different achievements and, um, you know, it, you kind of, you gain, it shows you how much you've participated in guild activities to sort of boost everything. Um, I like that mechanic because it sort of helps people um, start playing together. Okay. So... As far as, um, let's see, I have a question. Will Guild Wars 2 need a DKP system? Oh, God. <laughs> Kai, do you want a DKP system? Let's, why don't, why don't I explain what that is to people that may uh, not know. Um, the, the bane of all guild leaders' existence. Oh, man. Dragon kill points was, was the system that was put into place for a lot of guilds in World of Warcraft, for example. But I think it might have been around... Um, uh, for a while uh, it could have been from EverQuest so the way that it works is in WoW you needed to get a certain amount of gear for your character from various raids you know certain tiers worth of gear and in order to get it let's say uh, some leather pants drop and maybe the hunter and the um, rogue who both need agility need those pants Right, you need to have you need to have these pants on the ground, and they both want it, and they both would like to get it. Well, for showing up to guild events and participating, you would be awarded DKP, uh, and then you could spend that point to basically roll on and take the gear, and that way people who showed up got rewarded by getting gear and advancing, and people who didn't didn't get it, and it was sort of a way to organize things. But with the fact that everyone gets a quote unquote key at the end of a dungeon that they can spend to buy a piece of gear, there doesn't seem to be any need for dragon kill points. There's not even any yeah. tier systems. Any kind of idea there's going to be outside game systems built around? Can you think of anything else that you would need that kind of a system? I don't know. There's... I mean, I'm actually pro DKP. I've always used DKP when I've like raided in the past, and in Rift when I had a guild, I used DKP because... A lot of people hate it, but I think it's the fairest way where you can balance things and you, know, you can change how much people earn and how much people spend. However, I think at the moment when we only have kind of five-man dungeons at Endgame, it'd be pretty pointless to give five people DKP and you know have to balance it around how many dungeons they do compared to other groups. And as you said, people, everyone's going to guarantee to get a key and get something out of it, even if it's just saving up currency for a bit of gear. Um, I don't think it's necessary, and I'm quite glad it's not, because I hate moderating DKP. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you reset your webcam, Kai? Oh, yeah, sure. It screws up my interface. <laughs> I wish there was a way around that. Anyway, let's see. Um, what other questions do I have here? Systems. So, let's say... This is going to be an interesting question. Vega, you're looking for a guild. 
what and, and there's a whole list of guilds, you know, recruiting, you know, Team X, Team Y, Guild Z. What are you going to look for? Let's say they're all, you know, if you're particip- interested in, you know, PvP, then these are all the guilds, if they're interested in something else, these are all the guilds that you are interested in, whatever they are. What do you look for in one of these recruitment posters that makes you say, this looks like a guild worth joining? Um, well, first I try and look for if they have any sort of information on an age requirement or some sort of, like, statistic that says this is our average player age because, ah. uh, um, I mean, I've been in guilds that have, you know, like, teenagers in it, and sorry to the teenagers out there, but I just don't like playing that much with you. <laughs> 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 so, so for, first I look for that, and then, you know, if I'm, I kind of want to do a balance between PvP and PvE, or I guess I should say, like, the world PvP. Um, and so I want a nice balance between that. So, you know, finding a kind of, like, mature group um, that kind of is trying to touch a little bit on this and that. But, you know, at the same time, I'm not that hardcore, so I want a more, like, laid-back guild. And, you know, if I could get more of my friends into it, then that'd be great. I just I just don't like guilds that are really, you know, hardcore and structured. And, you know, I like more laid-back and just enjoy the game, enjoy the ride kind of thing. All right. Freelancer, let's turn the question around. Because I know you're in Team Legacy. You have been recruiting a bunch of people. What do you look for in a recruit that makes you say, ah, now here's somebody I want in my guild? Oh, Lord. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I actually have a a team of people that... that, Because one opinion alone, the problem with a lot of guilds recruiting now is it's just like you have this one guy that's a dictator. And he's like, I either like you because you suck up to me or I don't like you because you... You know, and that's a problem. So I have a, a group of people that look over everything because I like to get different opinions. Um, uh, first glance, I mean, he, Vega mentioned you know teenagers. It's not so much teenagers. I think it's maturity. You know, first when you look at an application or you talk to somebody, and we we make sure we talk to everybody in our guild because you just don't know a- anybody can pose as anybody. I can say my name is Chuck Norris. It doesn't mean <laughs> that I'm it Chuck mean Norris. You cry you're, cure you're for cancer. Yeah. So. You gotta, you gotta talk to people. You gotta, uh, you gotta get an aptitude, um, get their aptitude. You, you gotta get to know them. Um, it's so easy for people to claim things that they're not, um, and that's such a problem I have. I mean, we have, we've already had over 250 apps, and I, e- I can easily say that 70 plus of them were people that were typing exactly what they think you want to hear. And when I go to other guild websites... Is that and, easy and that, to detect? Like, when you look at it, does it look like they're trying to suck up to you? Some, yeah. Uh, some others, when you get to talking to them and you compare uh, an actual physical conversation with... You know, it's easy for somebody to say, I'm a gladiator, and wow. You know, that's everybody can type that because everybody knows from popular opinion that that must be a good thing to say, you know? Uh, but when you actually get to talking to them um, and you, you ask them about different scenarios or you ask them about different builds, different seasons, um, you really get down to the nitty-gritty and then you're, you can say, like, you could just pick up the obvious stuff, you know. I have uh, guys from, um, from WoW that do that, um, just the same as Guild Wars 1. I talked to a few of the admins at Team Quitter. Uh, I do suggest everybody use their resources. I mean, Team Quitter, as much as I disagree with a lot of people there, there are also a lot of people there that are really informative, top-of-the-line guys to talk to. And I run any Guild Wars 1-related apps through them. It's just, if you're running a guild, or you're recruiting for a guild right now, if that's something that you're aspiring to do to create a successful guild, you need to first cross-check your applicants. Do so in a manner that's fair. Don't do it by yourself. Get second opinion, third opinion. Get eight opinions on different people because you can never judge somebody. Uh, what is the saying? I can't judge a book by its cover, right? Um, but yeah, that I, I I can go ages and ages. But there's there's a long list of things. I just see too many guilds right now. The guilds that you see on Guru, for example, the there's 200, 300 something listed guilds that are recruiting right now. You will not see any of them in launch uh, except for maybe one or two percent of them why Mm -hmm. because the members they're recruiting a do not bother to be active they don't bother to get to know you you know like for example if i recruited uh, yeah just just to say hey i'm cool you know 
if I recruited Jay or I recruited Kaylee, you know, or or anybody, I would want to meet Kaylee. I would want to meet Jay. I want to talk to them. I want to play StarCraft with them. I want to play Battlefield 3. I want to talk to them about Dragons and Skyrim. I don't want to just see them on my roster just to say, hey, cool, I have, you know, this many people on my list. And that's, unfortunately, that's what too many guilds are doing right now. So when they actually get into the game, um, they're not going to know each other. You know, they're not going to have relationships. They're not going to be able to back each other up because what's the point you know i don't have anything invested in this guy or in this skilled member um so why should i waste my time on them and that's a big problem right now but that's something that um that we do that i think a lot of guilds should do i'm not against other guilds especially pvp guilds forming up i want there to be more hardcore pvp guilds out there uh i just want them to do it right i want to see their name in two years and, and I think that that should be really stressed to everybody that's thinking about starting a guild. Get to know your members. Um, go through an application process where you can know them beyond the actual application and develop relationships with them because those are the things you're going to remember years from now. Notice how he didn't. Notice how he said he didn't want to play with Bridger to be part of his guild. <laughs> uh, Bridger's already in. But see, even with Bridger, as busy as he is, uh, he is... He's active, he's friendly, he tries to get to know people, and I think every guild and every member in every guild should be like that. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people who play MMOs are sort of introspective, intro, introverse, 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 versus? what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> introverts. There's a T at the end. Um, a lot of people are introverts, and it's very difficult for a lot of gamers, especially MMO players, that's sort of the way that they can interact with people, and that... It, it, it really allows people to develop their social skills, to figure out how you introduce yourself, how you get to know somebody. And even simple, you know, drills like, for example, Team Legacy, not giving away any secrets here, meets on a regular basis, uh, on a weekly basis. And we sort of talk about, you know, plans for the guild and things like that. But then we also joke around and we have fun at the end of the meeting where we'll talk about Skyrim, we'll talk about this, we'll talk about that. Then you get to understand everybody's personality. And then the next time you come on TeamSpeak, you get to say, oh, hey, Armstrong, I remember who that guy was. He, we were joking around about X in the meeting or what have you. And you get to know people. That's an important part. It's, it's the community building. Um, and as far as I had one more question I wanted to just address to myself. <clears throat> Bridger, what would you tell someone uh, who is thinking of starting a guild? Ah, well, that's a very good question, Adam. If, uh, if, if somebody's thinking about starting a guild, uh, just know it's a lot. If you want to actually make a guild successful, and you want to be the person who founds it. If you don't have anybody helping you, it is going to take a lot of work to make a successful, you know, PvP style oriented guild or even a large guild. Five people, you can do that, not a problem. But if you want to organize things, people won't show up when they say they will. People will be disagreeable. You're going to have to put the foot down. There are it it, it is impossible to describe how much more difficult it actually is than what you think it's going to be. Um, but it's certainly possible, obviously, and it's much easier if you can share the weight with somebody that you trust. So right, take, take this for example. Kaylee, let me just throw this question out at you. If you yeah. were part of a raiding guild, PvE or PvP, doesn't really matter, um, and you didn't know anybody surrounding you, and you may, maybe you had a few you know, you had your clique, and, and a lot of raiding guilds, unfortunately, fall into that problem. But you have your own little clique, and that's your clique. And then you have, like, uh, 18 other people around you. All right, so you're, you're at the boss. You're, you're, let's say, doing Ice Crown, right? And you're raid wipes, all right? Damn, you know, we, we just can't do this. It's getting rough. What do you think happens to a guild where they have no relationships versus they, one that does. Yeah, they argue, people fall out, people rage, quit, shout at each other, blame someone they don't have to work as a team and that's what it's about, teamwork. And if you don't have the relationship, it, yeah, it will just fail. Yeah, and, and see, how many guilds, well, I, I, I can answer this question. Let me, let me ask you, Bridger, how many guilds have you seen rise and fall over your gaming career <laughs> due to inter-guild uh, drama 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 <laughs> plenty plenty yeah i mean i i was part of um the more successful guilds that I, uh, clans that i was a part of were ones that were you know organized by somebody who had the time to organize you know they had the time to sit down and say okay we're going to meet at this time and here's the plan and here's what we're going to do that's that's very important because if somebody the guy who's ostensibly running the thing 
comes the thing and goes, um, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about defense on map X, I think. Hang on, let me find my notes. That kind of person is not going to have a successful guild. So I've seen those, you know, the, the most successful ones I've been in have been those, but the ones that are, are very disorganized where the guy, you know, says that we're going to meet in one day and then he doesn't show up. That's a problem. I mean, and then you have people in the guild that may be very good at the game. They may be very good friends with you, but they start drama with other people. That can just cause so many problems. I don't even want to show up to practice because this guy's going to rag at me about this or that or the other thing, and he's going to yell at me whenever I fail. Like, that's, that's a terrible environment. The, the mm -hmm. most important thing is that everybody respects each other. You can respect somebody else and have fun and say, oh, man, I can't believe you missed that easy thing and sort of have it be a fun thing without actually, you know, saying, putting someone down and saying, I'm better than you because you failed and you let us down, blah, blah, blah. That kind of a thing. You know, if you're, if you're a guild leader and you want to deal with somebody who's not performing, you don't do it in front of everybody else. You take them aside some other time and you say, listen, you're clearly, you know, the weak link here and here's why and this is what you need to improve. Otherwise, we have to let you go. You don't do that in front of everybody else. You don't say, Johnson, this time you drop the ball and I don't want to see that again because that, that nobody wants to then, people are terrified to ever take any chances, to ever do anything. And we're going you know, off in a guy, way different direction. That, 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 that guy in the DKP minus video, <laughs> you know, the guy being chewed out for running to the dragon whelps or whatever. Uh, uh. Imagine how he felt at the end of that video. He didn't want to be part of that clan anymore. <laughs> I remember when I was like the first guild I probably raided with in World of Warcraft and we were doing ICC and it was Professor Future Side and no, no one could avoid that damn slime on Heroic. And someone actually got kicked from the guild because the second time he stood in the slime. And I felt so bad. Like <laughs> people just make these silly mistakes. And then when you start like shouting at someone, they get flustered and stressed. Go sit and in the corner. Yeah, no one wants to play a game that's causing them to actually have a heart attack every time they get shouted at. I think I think that patience takes plays a big role in having a successful guild. Because yeah. you, know, like, you really need the people who know what they're doing to want to step up and help people that may not know as much. And, and you know, the other thing that, that contributes to that kind of problem in these other games where if you screw up twice you're out is because they're so the, the the raids in for example wow are so time intensive that if one person screws it up for everybody that is a huge loss whereas in you know guild wars 2 i don't think we're going to have at least not any kind of pressure to that extent to where you have this guy Lee, do not go away from the headley go away okay <laughs> dps slowly Come here, you fucking cunt! Touch the tail! <laughs> well... Crush him was fair than to it. WHO THE FUCK WAS THAT?! <laughs> Crush him? WHAT THE FUCK?! <laughs> Welch! Left side! Even side! Many welts! Now handle it! <laughs> I have to say, I've got like that, like, on two occasions, I've been that bad. <laughs> if you haven't seen that, and I'm sure most of the people listening have, you have to check it out. I'll put a link in the show notes. Bridge, are you officially made Tales of Tyria the best podcast ever? Ah, I hope so. <laughs> By including that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get sued by the guy that made it. But you have to watch it if you haven't seen it. You can't just listen. You have to watch the whole thing because the animations that were put to that were fantastic. I love how every time the guy says whelp, he uses um, Orlando Bloom <laughs> as the example of the whelp. Like, oh, Crusher got feared into the whelps and it shows somebody running into the <laughs> to Orlando Bloom hatching out of an egg. <laughs> Oh, man. That's just fantastic. I think we're running over time here. Uh, let's wrap it up. Any, any final thoughts that you guys wanted to talk about with regards to guilds before we, uh, we end the show? Don't be afraid to join guilds and leave guilds. Like, you shouldn't ever feel like you're stuck to one. Find one mm -hmm. that you like, and you'll happily just be in one. Great That's advice. Jay? Mm, do what makes you happy. There you go. Freelancer, <laughs> any final thoughts? Uh... If you're recruiting for guilds, don't tote around the whole I'm pro or we're going to be top because Guild Wars 2 is not out yet. Stop, please. <laughs> yeah, no <laughs> you, can't be top at, you can't be professional at a game that's not paying you and you can't be top at a game that's not out yet. Thank you. <laughs> <goodbye>. <laughs>
<laughs> no, very well put. Very well put. Look at your dreams. All right, so I think we're going to head out now, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for tuning into episode number eight. Uh, we do have a bunch of back episodes if you haven't seen anything before. I would appreciate it if you let people know. If you've got some friends that are interested in Guild Wars 2, tell them. We like to spread the audience. We've got quite a few people listening now, and we'd like to get some more. Uh, so if you have any feedback for us, if you want, you know, you know oh, I don't like it when, uh, you know, Bridger talks too much, you know, send it to us. Feedback at talesofteria.com. I'd love to hear from you. If you you want to respond to our question of the day that would be fantastic I would appreciate it today's question what is your best or worst guild related moment did you have somebody go crazy like the 50 DKP minus guy and if anybody sends in a really good story we'll read it on the air next week it's gonna be great thanks guys for tuning in if you enjoyed the show and you feel like giving us back some spare change you got there's a donation button on the website feel free but do not feel obligated thank you very much I am Bridger signing off have a good night Bye, everyone. Bye.